Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Founder Hour podcast. And this podcast is brought to you by Outer. Outer makes the world's most beautiful, comfortable, innovative, and high-quality outdoor furniture, all from sustainable materials, and is the only outdoor furniture with a patented built-in cover to make protecting it effortless. From teak chairs to fire pit tables, everything Outer makes has the look and feel of what you'd expect at a five-star resort for less than you'd pay at a big box store for something that won't last. Pat, and you know how much I love five-star resorts. Oh yeah, I do. And as you know, Pat and I spend a lot of time outdoors, and we love hanging out on our outer couches we're certain you'll love it too for a limited time get 10 percent off and free shipping at liveouter.com this is outer's best offer anywhere anywhere only available to the founder hour listeners get 10 percent off and free shipping at live o-u-t-e-r let me say that again for all you alphabet geeks live O-U-T-E-R dot com slash the founder hour. That's liveouter.com slash the founder hour. Terms and conditions apply. Let's get into the episode. Our guest today is Dave Linegar. Dave is the visionary leader of the Denver-based global real estate franchise Remax, which he co-founded with his wife Gail in 1973. Today, the company has more than 140,000 agents in almost 9,000 offices and a presence in over 110 countries and territories. Dave is well-respected internationally for his vast knowledge of the real estate industry and influence on housing policy and is widely credited with improving conditions for real estate agents by creating a successful business model, combining the maximum commission concept with a host of support services. He spent much of 2012 recovering from a life-threatening infection, and after multiple surgeries, weeks in intensive care, and months in the hospital, he returned to Remax World Headquarters and currently serves as chairman of the board. He chronicled his ordeal and recovery in an inspiration New York Times bestseller, My Next Step, An Extraordinary Journey of Healing and Hope. Please enjoy our conversation with Dave Linegar. All right, Dave. First of all, thank you for taking the time to uh, hang out with us and share your story. Uh, We're excited to learn about your early days and obviously how you built Remax and everything that you're working on now. So, you know, let's let's set it back all the way w- to when you were born. Um, where were you born? Uh, Marion, Indiana, farmland country, and uh, made up my mind by the time I was six that uh, the minute I could, I was leaving. And uh, I'd asked my dad at the time. I said, "Why do we live in a place like this? <laughs> we've been to Hawaii. We've been to Florida. We've been to California. Why do we live in a mud field?" And He went through all this stuff and, oh, well, it's where our family was born and that's where uh, our business is, our church and our friends. And I said, yeah, well, we could have church and friends in California or something. Right. And he finally, a little tired of it, said, look, you live in my house, you eat my food, uh, you'll do what I tell you to do until you're 18. When you're 18, uh, you can do anything else you want to do. And I promised him, I said, I turned 18, I'm never coming back. Yeah. Did, uh, did you have family there for like generations? Oh yeah. yeah. And so I turned 18 in a place called Vietnam and I sent a letter to my father. I said, this just beats the hell out of Indiana. I'm telling <laughs> you, man, there's helicopters and there's tanks, there's snakes, and there's actually some tigers. This is a fun deal here, dad. So <laughs> Dave, did, Dave, were you, were you drafted or was it more of a voluntary thing? Yeah, it was a volunteer thing. Why? Why'd you do it? Well, I went in early for college and uh, didn't have the self-discipline to study. And uh, it was just obvious to me that uh, that I really lacked the maturity uh, to be a college student. Uh, The military gave me uh, six or seven years, a chance to grow up, see lots of the world. I got to see some real heroes. And so uh, it was an awesome time for me to become a man yeah i guess leading up to that you know kind of as far back as you can remember what kind of kid were you i mean you mentioned not really having much of a desire to you know perhaps at that time to 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 learn in school or or that kind of stuff what 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 did you kind of like to spend your time doing oh i love the outdoors uh i love camping fishing boy scouts adventure stuff uh 
you know, if my parents forced me to do homework, I got really good grades. I'm smart. Yeah. Uh, but I think I had a little attention deficit. And uh, plus, I was very young. Uh, I was the youngest person in my class. So, uh, and I was those kind of small. Uh, but uh, I love cars. And man, by the time I was 15, uh, we were close to Detroit, obviously, about a hundred miles. And everybody grew up with the Indy 500 and so on. Right. So uh, those are my dreams. Yeah. And what did you, what did your parents do for, for work? Uh, they had 40 acres that they share cropped out to local farmers. And then my father was a partner in a, a mechanical construction company. Uh, uh, they did major uh, factories and schools. And at times they had as many as 700 different people working on their projects. So it was a pretty good sized company for that era of the, of the uh, state. Did you, did you have any desire to go to college and to get a formal education? Yeah, I tried it first, but in reality, uh, I was just too young and, uh, I got so far behind so quick. It was obvious that was not going to work for me. Um, so I got into the service, uh, started as an, an airman, an enlisted man, if you will, uh, stationed at Davis Monthan Air Force Base in, uh, Tucson, Arizona. Um, I had read a, uh, book on getting rich in the real estate business. It was a bestseller, uh, William Nickerson, how I turned a thousand dollars into a million dollars in my part time. And it actually became a college textbook on hmm. property management, but it was a, a, a uh, an individual uh, who had a full-time job. <clears throat> he found a small investment property, a duplex, fixed it up, rented it out for more, refinanced it and bought another one. And he built an empire that way. And at the time, the military was only paying me $128 a month. Uh, and so I was very ambitious to make more money and uh, I was working part-time jobs. Uh, but I found a property that I actually could buy, uh, part-time. I fixed it up. Uh, Where was it? It was, uh, on a main street in uh, Tucson, uh, it was 10,500 at the time. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, resold it in six months for about $16,000. A big profit. Oh, as compared to my part-time jobs mm -hmm. and my military pay. And so that kind of set the dial, if you will. And I just thought, man, that's the way to do it. And despite uh, different tours of duty and so on, uh, my wife and I started accumulating property. And uh, by the time that uh, I got out of the service, uh, I think we had bought 20, 21 different properties. Uh Along the way, I picked up a real estate license, never intending to be a real estate agent. I just wanted to save the commission on the investments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the die was cast. And as I was getting ready to get out of the service, uh, I decided I'd also try to sell. Became incredibly successful at it. Loved it. Uh, yeah. I liked working with people. And uh, I knew that my tour of duties were coming to an end. So I'd work for two companies there and learn the business a little bit. <clears throat> and then when I got discharged, uh, I moved to Denver because I hated the desert. And selling houses in the summer in the desert 50 years ago was tough. You couldn't leave the air conditioning running because the car would overheat. And so mm -hmm. it was in and out of a sweat box constantly. And I heard of God's country up there called Denver. Mm -hmm. And so we moved to Denver and the rest is history. Yeah, and before we get into this sort of period in your life, going back to when you were in the military, you kind of alluded to it a bit, but, you know, going into the service, what were some of the biggest things that you feel like impacted you and your life and the person you became afterwards that perhaps you wouldn't have gotten had you gone down sort of the college path that maybe your peers went through? Yeah, I'd say the military is very good if you're undisciplined to begin with. Uh, they do force you to become a very disciplined person or you don't make it. And so uh, that's kind of beat into you in basic training. And uh, then you print that pattern and the rest of everything you do. Mm. And I assure you in the military, 
if you run late in business world, people are annoyed. If you're late in the military, they take a stripe or they take some pay away from you or they fin finally throw you out. And so everything is very precise. Uh, there's a method to do everything. Uh, there's a system to do everything. And so once you fit into that, and I did fit into it very well, uh, I was very successful. Did you think that you would fit into it as somebody who kind of got into it as undisciplined as you say? Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like an easy fit to just be like, hey, Dave, you got to do this, this, this at this hour, that hour. I mean, was it frustrating at all in the beginning? Not at all. It was a... Uh, it was an overnight thing. Uh, I was excited. Uh, I remember going in. We got our haircuts, and everybody was upset about that. And then we went over and got in the supply line, and they started handing us boots. You look like a size 7. You look like a size 10. Pretty haphazard. And then you end up trading all your clothes out to somebody else so you can fit it. And then I was putting my uniform on with, you know, no stripes or anything yet. And I thought, man, this is really cool. I got a yeah. uniform. And everybody <laughs> else is saying, oh, this is stupid. Why do we have to wear a uniform? And so I guess my immaturity probably helped there. and The rest is history. How did, uh, how did you and your wife, Gail, meet? Uh, Gail was actually my second wife. Mm -hmm. uh, my first wife was uh, from the community I grew up in. Uh, I hired Gail uh, the day I started Remax and November 30th of 1973, hmm. over a three-day period, I interviewed 27 people to be an administrative vice president for my new company. And so I needed somebody that could do the management skills uh, that I lacked. And she had a college degree in marketing and worked for Walsh and Perina, uh, very poised, confident. And uh, uh, she was the 37th one I interviewed, and I knew on the spot this would be the perfect person for us. Mm -hmm. And so I needed somebody that could lease the office space, hire the secretaries, supervise the accounting department, uh, meet with the lawyers and handle the legal aspects and leasing and buy the furniture. And I would go yeah. out and take care of the sales staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back um, you, to, to, you know, you're in the service, you decide, you, re you read this book and, uh, on real estate and you decide to buy your first property. How did you learn? How did you begin to learn about the real estate market at the time? I mean, did you, was it from that book or like, did you have to go out there and sort of learn on your own? Uh, the book was very valuable. Uh, then I bought other books. Uh, then you learn by experience um, and you just, you just become part of it. Uh, learning to sell real estate, however, in the residential industry was a tough nut to crack. Uh, if you're trying to learn a business, figuring out property values, how do I write up a listing? How do I write up an offer? Uh, figuring out how to get a, a uh, appraisal, a raise that came in too low, solving the problems of everything. So, and that, and you're trying to find customers. And that's very difficult to do when you look like you're a teenager. Um, I stuck to it long enough, but once I got a few customers, I gave world-class service and, uh, I got a lot of referrals. Then it became a very easy job. Dave, you talk about having amassed a pretty decent, you know, portfolio of properties early on, even before starting Remax. Were these properties cash flowing for you? I mean, was it income or were you just essentially accumulating wealth and it wasn't necessarily liquid cash that was in your pocket no we did uh, pretty good on making money off of them uh we would always buy something that was uh run down but not in uh, a disaster situation and uh minor fixing up certain things you can do uh painting is one of them remodeling kitchens and bathrooms is is uh, always very valuable and getting the property price up lipstick so on a pig is what we call it right that's it. But what happens is uh, instead of flipping them, which is all the rage, of course, uh, we were holding them and renting them. And we basically were property managers. And so we were renting them for far more than what the mortgage payments were. So usually within a year or so, we had our money back out that we put into all the repairs and upgrades and then buy another one. And that's the way we were able to systematically buy several. 
Mm. What was, aside from the values, what was the biggest thing that was different about the market back then compared to what it is now? It was uh, a very simple business. Um, if you got a listing and you put it to the company and the multiple listing service, it was usually a one-page form. If you sold a contract, FHA, VA, it was a one-page contract. Uh, this is all before a buyer agency, the litigation explosion, uh, the industry changed so much over the next 20 or 30 years of uh, having to have buyer inspections and having to do all these different things that before it was just sold it and handed them the keys. Uh, mm-hmm. Fortunately, those of us that were in that era were able to grow up with the business. So when did the idea of doing more, right, starting Remax and not only focusing on building your own, you know, portfolio of properties, when did that come about? You know, about the time I made my first sale, um, commissions back then were split between the broker and the agent. And so if it was a listing, the listing portion, the broker got half. The agent got half. It was a buyer. Broker got half. The agent got half. And when you say broker and agent, just for our audience, your Remax, for example, is the broker. The agent is the person who works for that brokerage. That is correct. And so the brokerage uses their half to pay the administrative staff, office leases, internet charges, uh, advertising, management, training. Uh, and then they try to make a profit. Uh, the agents use their half. First, they have to pay their own personal expenses, and nobody provides health insurance, Social Security, retirement. They have to, uh, a lot of automobile expenses. Our automobiles use much more than a normal person would. And then what's left uh, is yours to live on. Um, in the real estate industry at that time, there was a tremendous turnover of agents, And back in the era of the 60s and 70s, nine out of 10 people that went and got a real estate license failed within the first year. And then the one that made it, maybe one out of four or five of those would make it five years and have a successful career. So the turnover was awful. But the longer you're in the business, the more you depend on referrals uh, because people come back to you because they trust you or they tell their kids, we bought two houses from Dave. Uh, you can believe him when he tells you what the value is. And that working by referral is important. But you're still giving up half your commissions. So it didn't take very long to figure out in that pricing that, you know, for two, three hundred hours, you could rent a small office. Answering service was thirty dollars a month. Didn't cost a couple hundred dollars a month to advertise in the newspaper. Put some signs up. Keep the whole commission yourself disadvantage of that is you gave up the bigger company image and you gave up the walk-in business. You're also competing with the biggest company in town that had a bigger ad budget. And so it's tough being a sole broker. Mm. So we came up with this concept of a professionally managed company that operates like a group of doctors, lawyers, and architects, a co-op, if you will. And they had to be experienced. They had to pay us in advance a pro rata share of the expenses, and then they got to keep uh, almost everything they earned themselves. So, and Dave, before before you had started Remax or come up with this concept, the idea of this brokerage model where you have agents and they have a split. I mean, did the, and they're essentially really their own owners, right, of their own little businesses. Did that not exist? Yeah, probably in mid nineteen sixties. Uh, first about a half a dozen companies experimented with it. Uh, but once we became successful, uh, it was imitated widely. We started in 73, uh, by five years, we were the number one company in Colorado. And, uh, we started franchising two offices in 75, uh, a couple more in 76. And then we went full-time franchising in 77 and opened uh, over 100 offices. The end result was when we went to the trade show for the National 
Association of Realtors in uh, 78, there were then 178 companies uh, that were having booths that said they were the next national company. And by that time, Century 21 was big. ERA was big. Uh, Remax was fledging. We were just getting started. Big in one particular market. Uh, Caldwell Banker got into the act. Sears came in, started residential. Caldwell Banker, uh, Prudential came in. Merrill Lynch came in. And so all of a sudden, there were hundreds of people that looked at the Remax concept and they said, well, why should we buy a franchise? We just imitate it. Mm-hmm. And I ideas agree. are not patentable. Interesting. So, so what, what was it then that, you know, you feel like really set Remax apart in those early days to, to then hit the sort of growth that it did in the years that followed? Um, we understood the nature of franchising. I had no intention to franchise in 73, but I saw the success franchising was having and that it's an easy way to expand and you're expanding with other people's money. So instead of going public and getting a couple hundred million dollars and spending the money to start brokerages, uh, give them a system and let them network uh, and take a much smaller fee, but they put their own capital at risk and therefore they work a lot harder than just an employee would. And so once the momentum kicked in, it became very easy. The first two or three years was an absolute disaster. Dave, you didn't necessarily have corporate business training. So how did you even think that this franchising model was going to work? I mean, where did you come up with the idea? Of what, what, what companies were uh, an inspiration, per se, to you uh, to replicate that model in the real estate industry? Well, basically, the idea I, I picked up on it from was McDonald's. And obviously, uh, they were just hitting their stride in the 60s and 70s. And many books and articles were written on them. And so even though I, I was not college educated, uh, I realized very early after starting Remax that I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was desperate to save the company. And when you're desperate, you find a way. And most of it was mentoring. Some of it was courses that I took, uh, like American Management Association. And probably two, three years, I probably took 10 five-day courses on understanding financial statements for a non-financial person uh, and how to manage and lead advertising and marketing uh, uh, seminars. Uh, Then I embraced all the education I could get in the real estate industry and the biggest thing that happened, though, was it was frustrating t- to be losing. And I had a thick enough skin that I would sit with the people I'd hired. And the ones I hired didn't leave. It was just trying to get other people to convert. And I would sit and say, what did you like best about the company you used to work for? And tell us, and maybe we could implement that here. What did you dislike the most? And we'll try not to imitate that. What do you like most about being with Remax? What would you like least about it? And then the the killer question is, I was 20 years younger than all of my branch managers as I opened my companies. And so I'm in my mid-20s, and they're all in their 40s with 20 years of experience. So I had to rely on them for experience. And I just flat out tell them, obviously, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. If you were the run or the leader of this company, what would you do? Right. And they told me <laughs> uh, real estate agents and brokers, they're, they're not shy. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very entrepreneurial and they'll voice their opinion. And most of the time they'll give you a fair and honest opinion. You just have to be willing to swallow your pride and say, you know, you're absolutely right. We've got to implement that somehow. You know, Dave, that's a very, uh, very key ingredient to leadership, right? Listening and not just hearing other people, not just hearing their thoughts and opinions, but actually taking in the audio and processing what they're saying and actually trying to do something about it. Um, what what gave you kind of that skill set? Was it the military that taught you how to be a good listener? 
somebody that, you know, sits down, hears out what other people have to say, and then does something about it? I mean, I'm just curious as to how that came to be, because a lot of people aren't necessarily the best listeners. You know what the military taught me was uh, it's a team effort. Uh, nobody succeeds by themselves. And you have to, to lean on the team. Uh, you've got to depend on the guy that's next to you. Um, I can tell you combat soldiers, uh, if they're under combat and they're in a foxhole and they're being shot at, they're not fighting for the flag and the darn well are not fighting uh, for the country. They're fighting for their brother or sister that's inches away from them because you're both going to die. And so you fight for each other. You bleed with each other. And it also teaches you that it doesn't make a damn bit of difference whether you're straight or gay or lesbian. It doesn't make any difference if you're black or brown or white that you're in a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're not in the combat role, uh, the combat roles depend upon you. And so that's the one thing that the military really did better than the civilian world did. The... uh, multicultural and the multi, uh, uh, shall we say, not being too concerned about gender uh, has made this transition from the Civil War uh, to the present conflicts we're in. In the Civil War, they had some black soldiers that they wanted liberty to, but they couldn't fight with the white soldiers. Uh, Then by the time you got to World War I, it was totally segregated. Uh, by the time you got into World War II, it started uh, putting blacks and whites and Asians together, even though they were still like, if you were Japanese American, you couldn't fight in the South Pacific, but you could fight in Italy. Right. And so everybody was afraid them may, might turn on you and be a terrorist or something. But little by little, up through Vietnam was the big barrier that, that broke everything. By that time, we had all kinds of people, different uh, cultures, I should say, and starting to have women, and that kind of broke down everything. And now, I mean, women in combat roles. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know Venice Armour, uh, <laughs> delightful black lady, and I've we've hired her to speak at our convention. I've heard her several times. She was the first black woman, lesbian, fighter pilot in the history of the Marines. Mm-hmm. And she's, she has, she's the nicest person in the world. She could care less what she is, what she is. And she was the only woman out of 380 some men in this, uh, this group. And she was just determined that she'd be the best pilot she could be. And she earned their respect. And uh, so the military is, has been fabulous. It's, they still have hurdles to go over like everybody else, but they led the way. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of just like the franchising sort of model, you talk, you, you talk about McDonald's. I don't know. Did you ever, ever have a chance to meet and speak with Ray Kroc? I did not. Uh, yeah. Didn't have that opportunity at the time. Um, knowing what I know now, uh, I would have searched him out and found some way to spend an hour or two with him. And yeah, but, uh, uh, the one of the problems that you get into is that uh, a lot of mentors don't have the time to mentor everybody. And uh, I was on a uh, podcast a week ago that Darren Hardy puts on, mm-hmm. and uh, he had one of his top students of all times, uh, Misty Loan. And Missy's, uh, uh, I don't know, age, 40-ish, middle age, uh, 20, 25 years younger than me. And we were in a speaking contest in a small group. And I won, and I went up to her and said, Misty, I know how hard you prepared. And you were a wake-up call to me today. I, I won first place by a big margin, and I didn't know what I was going to talk about before I stood up. I said, I relied on 50 years of experience. And you're a reminder to me that I could be better than I am now. And I said, you tried so hard 
can I help you with your next speech? And that started a friendship. Um, she had one dance studio at the time. Uh, we became very close. Uh, she was married to her high school sweetheart, five children. And all of a sudden our families got together annually for a week at the ranch and uh, very respectful kids and great mother and father and uh, straight A students, just the kind of people you want to be around. And so we started working together and in four years, she had changed and franchised her business with 200 open uh, dance schools. Mm, very cool. And so Darren was talking about this mentor relationship and how important it was. And that uh, he went on to say, one of the problems that people like Dave and myself have is that lots of people ask us to be a, a mentor. And it's like talking to a wall and that we can tell them, Everything we found in our experience, it's up to them to implement and do something with it. He says the vast majority of the people we speak to will say, that's interesting. That's wonderful. Yeah, I like that. But very few people will execute on the ideas. And yeah. So in terms of, I guess, um, so the question I, I was going to kind of get to with franchising was, you know, when do you know... I mean, when did you feel like it was the right time? Was it after you had sort of built a, a recognizable brand already, so that you w so that way you could attract, you know, franchisees and um, you know have like sort of this brand already? Or yeah, I guess when when did you kind of know it was the right time? You know, by the time that we became number one in Denver, uh, we were written up in every realtor publication there was. Uh, young kid in his twenties starts out and five years later is bigger than two of the biggest companies in the history of the industry and did it on a, on a uh, shoestring, if you will, with no outside capital. And so everybody wanted me to speak all over the country, state conventions, national conventions. And uh, I said, man, this idea is pretty franchisable. Uh, we should franchise this. And it was an easy sell because I'd stand in front of a crowd and say, look, if a 27-year-old kid that didn't get to college can start with nothing and do what I did underneath this system and these techniques, think what a polished, successful college graduate could do with this. And a lot of people bought into it, and uh, th it was not an overnight success. It took us uh, basically five years to get to the 300 agents. At 10 years with franchising, we were at 3,000. At 20 years, 30,000. At 30 years, 90,000. And at that point, we we're unstoppable. This episode is brought to you by Axiom Print, based in the greater LA area. Printing is essential to every business's success and crucial for marketing and building your brand. There are over 200 products available on their website for convenient online ordering, and custom requests are always welcome through one of Axiom's dedicated account managers. You can upload your design, choose your options, and make payment all from the comfort of your computer or even on the go using your phone 24 hours per day. And if you're not sure how to design your material, no problem. Their team of experienced designers will work with you to create professional and eye-catching designs that effectively market your brand. So if you're looking for a reliable and affordable printing partner, look no further than Axiom Print. Check them out at axiomprint.com and be sure to use the promo code THEFOUNDERHOUR to get 15% off your first order or share the promo code with your dedicated Axiom Print account manager. All right, let's get back into the show. What made you such a good salesperson? I was passionate about what I believed in. And if you think about it, the leaders that are most followed all have one common attribute. Mm -hmm. And that is they all sell hope. If you look at a man like uh, Martin Luther King, he was not angry at the world. He was trying to inspire people to find your way. The doors will open for us. We have to work at it. And he sold hope that someday we will have equality in our country. And that resonated with millions of people. And it wasn't just 
people of color. Mm-hmm. It resonated with an unbelievable number of, I would say, Democrat or left wing or liberal people, if you would. And so his hope changed the entire world. Uh, if you look at somebody like uh, Ronald Reagan, he sold hope. And he said, make America great. Uh, Trump tried to follow up with make America great again. Uh, If you look at Hillary Clinton, in her campaign, it was follow Hillary. She knows the way. That's not selling hope. But if you look at every commercial that Obama ran, it was all centered around a face and just four letters, hope for a better future for our people. Deep, just to play devil's advocate a, a little bit here, uh, when is hope not enough, right? As a leader, right, you've been running, you know, Remax for 40, 45 years, you know, up until a few years ago. You're, you're, the initial sell is obviously hope, right? You're going to be able to come here. We're going to provide you the resources, the guidance, the mentorship, the platform. You're going to be able to do what you want to do on your terms at your own time. That's the hope. And then there needs to be that second thing of like what you talked about earlier, execution, where it's on them to execute on that hope. Did you have to play a role in that? I mean, how do you keep these folks successful beyond the hope? It's constantly selling and reselling the dream. That you can be better than you are. You can succeed at a higher level than you ever have. I had... A unique advantage in that we started accumulating some of the highest producers in the history of the business. The beginners and part-timers, they couldn't afford to come to work for us. And so the more people we had that were doing good, the more people looked from the outside saying, are you really making more money? Do you really have more freedom at that company? And once you had enough people uh, in your audience that we're agreeing with you, then that keeps selling it. Uh, but nothing's easy. Uh, this was not an overnight success. I mean, <laughs> the 50th convention coming up, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of these things behind the scenes that most people never even heard about mm-hmm. that made the fabric of the company. The thing that is most unique about really good salespeople is that they succeed in good markets and bad markets. Now, if you look at the 50-year history of REMAX, we've lived through nine presidencies or administrations. Some were crooked. Some were stupid. A couple were pretty good. And I think some of them are pretty crooked. So it doesn't make any difference. Uh, We grew for 50 years. This is our eighth recession. We started the company in the first oil embargo in 1973, and you couldn't get gas for your car to show houses. The second embargo was 78, savings and loan crisis, uh, about 81 or 82. The SNLs, 50, 60 percent of them bankrupt in less than six months, hundreds of thousands of foreclosures. You had to adapt to that. Interest rates went from 5 percent to 18 percent. You had to adapt to it. And then you move forward, a couple more recessions, then the great, great depression, if you will, of 2008, the housing collapse, the financial collapse, and you have to adapt to it. And what's happened is the the driven, the passionate, the ones in love with their industry that love what they do will find a way. It's just like the military says, over, under, around, or through, we're going to get there. Yeah. You know, we often hear about there being, you know, peacetime leaders and CEOs and then wartime leaders and CEOs. And sometimes one is not good at the other and vice versa. And it, it you know, it, it's, it's tough to find leaders that can really excel in both environments. And so f- for you, having gone through all these cycles and being like the peacetime leader and then also the wartime leader during these, you know, really bad recessionary periods, um, what, what is something that you co- sort of, what is like your approach, at least in the in like the wartime situations, that it, it allowed you know Remax to to continue to survive and and thrive beyond it, uh, versus you know uh, potentially just going down pr- with other companies. 
you survive or you die. It's that simple. And how much grit and determination do you have inside of your heart to state, I know everything's overwhelming. It's pretty black, dark, and stormy out there, but we're going to make it through this. And the thing that's interesting about that is the more that you're tested and the more times you fail and get back up, because you only fail permanently when you finally don't get back up. And I put it in perspective for you. In 2012, uh, I went into the hospital, uh, reasonably paralyzed from my waist down, uh, figured it was herniated disc. We'd put off back surgery. And so I went in at five in the morning on a Sunday thinking a Monday or Tuesday, I'd have an operation and go home in a couple of days. And I went into toxic shock. They put me in ICU in less than an hour. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. Uh, I went into a coma for three months. They tried to put me in hospice for three months. Uh, They discovered after three or four days, I had MRSA, which happens to Vietnam vets who have been soaked in Agent Orange. Mm -hmm. And if you had a weak immune system, you got cancer in five years. If you had a strong immune system, you get cancer between 65 and 70. And I did it. Then I flatlined, and then when I woke up, uh, managed to get me into a spinal cord rehab center, and I was a quadriplegic for another six months. And so as I laid there and I started coming to, I asked all these doctors and psychiatrists, what's my thinking ability? And they would say, well, it's about that of a six-year-old right now. And it's, okay. (laughs) <laughs> at the end of the summer, I said, okay, what am I up to now? And they said, we've got you into high school. And I said, well, don't go getting too anxious now because there ain't no college. <laughs> and uh, I was just sheer determination. What Everything that happened to me up to the day I went in that hospital, I had built survival, success, grit, and ambition that I would not fail. And I did fail with stuff. I failed at my first marriage. I didn't work at it. I found out what I did wrong. I knew what I did wrong. I was just totally in love with my company. And that happens with entrepreneurs. It's it's your dream. I mean, stand on stage with thousands of people applauding. It's a hell of a lot more fun than taking the kids to a baseball game. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes you got to make some mistakes and learn from them. So that the second try maybe is a much bigger success. So, yeah. If, if you look at it, I looked at youngsters that were in the spinal cord rehab. They're usually 15 to 25. They're usually male. Uh, they have traumatic brain injuries or spinal cord. It's usually because they're stupid. They ride a skateboard without a helmet. They ride a bicycle. They get drunk driving a motorcycle when they're 18 years old at 100 miles an hour. Uh, they fall out of a cherry picker because they didn't wear a safety helmet. And they didn't have a safety um, vest on strapped into the cherry picker and it's the kids just boy babies brains don't mature fast enough women do a much better job and so when I looked at it it hurts to be paralyzed it hurts to go to therapy it hurts to have people stretch and move you and make you use exercises when you have tendons have shortened and you've been fetal position and and so the vast majority of them would say I don't want to do therapy. I want to watch television. I'm crippled. It doesn't make any difference. I'm never going to walk. Um, My attitude was push me harder than anybody you've ever pushed in your life. I will not quit on you. I'll be your best patient. You're going to eat me before I'm done, but I'm walking out of this place. Well, I didn't, but I did manage to keep going to therapy for a few more months and did learn how to walk again. And I use an electric wheelchair Half the time, I use a cane and walk about 5,000 steps a day. So I think I've done pretty good. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is a young kid came in who was a motocross star and had a dirt bike, and he was doing jumps and jumping over stuff and flips and all that. You've seen it on television. He was doing this from the time he was five years old. By 18, 
his champion, national, all over the place, trophies you couldn't believe. And he had a bad crash. He got down in the C4 region and uh, no solution for that. And so he knew he would never use his legs again. He told the nurses the same thing I did, the therapist. He said, I know how to win. I've been winning for the last 15 years of my life against tough, tough competition. I'm not going to let this get me down. Show me how to live with this, and I'll be the best paraplegic you've ever seen in your life. Hmm. And he did. And he got out of there. He went back to college, got a four-year degree. He has a happy life right now. And so he had the stamina. He had the resiliency. He had the fact that he'd been hurt many times, and he worked his way through it that gave him the toughness when this huge challenge came to not just roll over and say, I quit. So anybody out there that thinks their life's tough and the world's a tough place and you got financial problems, you got this, you got that. <laughs> no, you don't have any problems. My first speech back to Remax uh, was a year and I was still in an electric wheelchair. I could, I could walk 10 steps. I went out. And um, charismatic leadership, they showed before I went on board a collage of me coming into the conventions on an elephant, walking through the convention with a uh, Metro the Lion from MGM Grand in my hand, doing all these ballet trips and trapeze trips over the audience. And so kind of flamboyant. And so they ran some film clips of the doctors stating how serious it was. And nobody gave me a chance of living in Nobody said I'd ever walk again and how determined I was. And I came out, got a standing ovation. And let me put this straight to you. I told him what it was like to be a multimillionaire with all the freedom in the world, with all the success I'd had, driving race cars, flying fighter jets, doing uh, scuba diving, skydiving, ballooning, all these things. And all of a sudden to be 100% dependent I couldn't brush my teeth. I couldn't shave. I couldn't even go to the potty by myself. And then in the middle of the sentence, I was teaching them about the steps to achieve a goal, find an achievable goal. Uh, and if it's achievable, make it realistic. Then a step-by-step -step plan and get yourself a mastermind group that will help you achieve your goal and, and keep you on the straight and narrow. And all that is is – the concept from think and grow rich mm -hmm. and then just keep working at it and never give up, never quit. So in the middle of my speech, I looked out audience knew me. Uh, I'd known most of them for many years of their life. Uh, I'd done motivational speeches for 250 days a year for 30 some years. And I said, would you do me a personal favor? Yes. Please stand up. The room stood up, except for a couple of friends of mine that were in wheelchairs. <laughs> we smiled at each other. Hmm. And as they were standing, I said, do you understand how wealthy I am? Do you understand that Gail and I would give every dollar of our money that we've got to be able to start broke and be able to do what you just did and stand up? Room's quiet. People start crying. And I said, you think you got problems? Everybody's got problems. But you got your health for the most part. You can start over. If you fail, you can always start over. Just never quit. When you quit, you've lost forever. And so that's been my attitude. Uh, I've tried to rub it off on other people. Um, sometimes it's a... You have to be nasty and mean to people. I go to rehab hospitals all the time for spinal and head injured. And I walk through and have them crying. And, oh, this hurts so much. I said, <laughs> brother, I know it does. I did it for two years. You want to walk like I did? Or are you just going to stay the way you are? Take the pain and work your way through it. It's worth it in the end. That's a, that's a, very inspirational story. I'm not surprised that many wanted to work for you and Remax because of clearly the inspiration that you were to them and the uh, 
and it wasn't just through your word, but also through the actions that you obviously had achieved uh, throughout the years. Uh, you were the CEO at uh, Remax for 40, 45 years. Uh, what, what got you to the point to say, you know what, it's time to pass this on to the next uh, generation or to the next, to the next leader. And I'm going to focus on the next chapter of uh, my life post Remax. I was CEO of Remax for the first 10 years. Yeah. I was traveling literally 250 days a year and it never slacked off. And then we started international. Then we went to Europe and then we went to Asia. And so I realized uh, I was the spokesman for the company, uh, majority owner of the company. But the truth of the matter is, is that I was able to hire more qualified people than uh, I was myself. When you start a company, you're the chief cook and bottle washer because you got more time than money. And then when you become successful, you can hire a CFO. You can hire a chief legal officer. You can hire a marketing officer that has better skills. Mm-hmm. And so in 10 years, uh, Gail had progressed from uh, a vice president and regional director to uh, president to CEO, uh, of all things, uh, we were engaged to be married at that time. We didn't become romantically involved for almost 10 years. And uh, we were visiting Canada uh, to a convention, and she was injured in a plane crash, a uh, traumatic brain injury with some paralysis. She, too, went through a uh, rehab center for spinal cord. And... Uh, after three years of therapy, she went back to the company. Uh, and then uh, we had a, I don't know, five-year period. Then we promoted another of our individuals that had been with us from the first day that was very organized. Then another one. And then finally, the last one that we had promoted, uh, it was about 2013 after we went public she decided to retire. So I did step back in at that time as a public company and said I would be CEO for five years uh, while we put one of my three or four mentees in the position, at which time uh, Adam Contos became my co-CEO for a year. And then I retired the the active duty. Uh, I still work for the company about 80 days a year in board of director meetings conventions, uh, financial calls, and that sort of thing. Um, but he did a fabulous job, and uh, we're now looking for another CEO. So we've had five CEOs in 50 years, which is a pretty good record. Yep. Yep. And he and I and uh, Gail and two other partners uh, started a venture capital, private uh, family business, if you will, that invests in emerging franchisors. So, so talking about post, you know, uh, well, I guess in the last, you know, five to 10 years, what have you been mostly involved with outside of Remax? I know you do a lot of philanthropic work. I know you're kind of back in the game with, uh, with franchising, you know, restaurants and things like that. So kind of share a little bit about what, what you've been up to. Well, you know, in most of my active life, uh, I like to fish and camp and hunt, big time photographer. I uh, love skydiving. I did almost three or 4,000 scuba dives. I uh, competed in NASCAR for 10 years. Uh, competed in uh, jet fighters that were doing aerobatics and stuff. And uh, I was an adrenaline junkie. I liked all that stuff. Um, the doors close. Uh, when I was 63, I was still hitting over 200 miles an hour on Daytona. But... 63 is not the same as 50 and nobody does it at 63 and it sure as heck isn't what you do at 77. So uh, a door shuts there. What are you going to do? Sit in a bar and get drunk? Or are you going to sit in a rocking chair and watch TV? So I like being in the game. Yeah. Uh, I like young entrepreneurs. I like people that are chasing a dream. Uh, if you want an old dog to get some new life before it's over, get him a puppy. 
It happens every time. So basically, the challenge of using 50 years of experience or more and being able to have the capital to look at somebody who is trying to do what we did 50 years ago, but they don't have the capital, the experience, they don't know how to scale up, they don't know how to borrow the money, they don't know how to uh, hire an international marketing team. We've got all those contacts. And so I don't want to ever run their business for them, but we as a group are an incredible resource and we can point them in the right direction. If they're coachable, they're going to win. If they're not, we're going to fail together. And so it's not enough just to take experience and money to the table. You better darn well have a great concept because any concept can be imitated. And you better have a great starting team that you believe in that has the grit and determination to take it the next step. Dave, would you start Remax today knowing what you know about the business, knowing what you know about today's market, or was timing obviously a big factor to the success that eventually took place with the company? I think timing made a difference. Uh, I mentioned in 78 at the National Convention, 178 companies, all their franchise salesmen running around to attendees. In five years, there's only going to be uh, 80% of the business be done by five companies. They'll all be big and national. So if you don't join us now, you're going to be out of business. And some people actually believe that nonsense. I never <laughs> believed it at all. The thing that's interesting is 178 companies all trying to imitate Century 21, uh, Merrill Lynch, and Prudential coming into business. There's never room for it. And so the end result was, if you look at those companies, there's only five or six of us still around. But we do control 60% of the market. Mm -hmm. But it's taken 40-some years, 50 years. It didn't happen in five years like was predicted. And so realistically, to start a new franchise in a business that already has tremendous market share by five or six or seven brand leaders, that's a pretty tough pot to go. So why do people still do it? Because we see new companies popping out every week. It's, everybody has a new twist. Everybody has a new thought. The uh, thing you have to remember is that in franchising, uh, there are 15, 1,600 franchisors, franchising companies, uh, that belong to the International Franchise Association in the United States. The United States has 4,000 franchisors. That means that over half of them don't have enough money to join the trade association. So they're not serious. Uh, some of us have thousands, tens of thousands of units. Probably 60 or 70% of the franchisors have less than 20. Mm-hmm. So every year, 400 new franchisors come out with a new concept, a twist on an old concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, The probability of out of the 400, 20 of them making it long-term, it's pretty low. Yeah. What do you think, um, what do you think happens to the sort of residential real estate market in the last in the next like 10 to 15 years um what you know with new technologies that come out you know people often think that you know technology is gonna or like robots are gonna replace everyone's job when you know in reality that's probably not gonna happen exactly in that way but it's gonna make it's gonna change things right and so uh what do you what do you envision what do you think is gonna happen before i answer that let me just say one thing um everybody asked me what's the biggest change you saw over the last 50 years in the real estate industry. And the biggest change that came about is how rapidly the change is keeps occurring. The change is coming faster and faster and faster. Hmm. And so the technology companies all pitch, buy our technology, we're going to put you out of business, everybody's going to buy the house over the TV, they don't have to walk through it, see it, smell it. Um Some people have, but for the most part, it's a complex sport and most people want a trusted advisor. And I bought a ranch about, I don't know, eight years ago. And uh, I know the industry. 
Uh, I knew real estate, had a broker's license for 40 some years. Uh, I certainly could have done it on my own, but I didn't know ranch business. And so I went to some of our people that had ranch experience and they get paid a full commission for putting me on the property that I wanted. It was worth the cost to me. Hmm. And so everybody is working in some pretty tough waters right now. Residential was down almost 30% this year. New homes, probably more than that. Uh, by the end of this year, it'll be okay. Uh, what you have to do is figure out how do you adapt to each situation? And adaptability is a king. Uh, Darwin is said to have claimed the strongest of the species survives. He never said that. What he said was the most adaptable of the species survives. Right. The dinosaurs were the strongest and they disappeared. The mosquito is still here 500 million years later. It mm -hmm. evolved. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the future of the real estate business, it's actually my keynote speech at the uh, Remax convention here in a month. And it's basically is you have to look at the speed of change. You have to look at the history of what happened and you have to understand this rapid change is going to continue. You have to be at the top of your game. You have to look at every opportunity that comes along and say, does this make logical sense or is this another pipe dream? And of all the technology out there, 90% of them failed. And they even talk about it. Fail faster so that you can finally succeed. Doesn't matter who you screw, when you go bankrupt, how many people you disrupt, just fail and be a billionaire someday. There aren't that many. And the truth of the matter is, is uh, machines are not going to sell real estate. Will it change? Sure. When, when we tried to switch our agents from voicemail back in the 70s or from um, answering service to voicemail, it was a rebellion. I'm not going to have my customers talking to a telephone. Well, three years later, all of these 600,000 people that were doing part-time work as call centers answering calls was gone. And so we don't know what the changes are going to be. What we have to do is watch everything like a hawk, do your business as best you know how to do, and keep adapting. Dave, what are some of the franchises that you're involved with today? You know, uh, we got involved with a company called Daddy's Chicken Shack a year and a half ago. Uh, we spent a year uh, building their company for them. Uh, they were the cooks, the chefs. Uh, they knew how to run a restaurant. Uh, we were the legal uh, backbone. We established the documents, the trademarks. <coughs> we went out. We built the learning management systems, uh, helped them with the technology, uh, set up all the legal documents to make them legal to open in all 50 states, uh, and put the marketing team together. We opened our first uh, prototype, Houston, in uh, October. Uh, we've now sold 13 regions of a million population to 10 different investment groups. And we're in the process of opening about 20 more daddy's chicken shacks, uh, two of them in the next three months. And so wow. they've got a good start and we'll push it really hard for them and keep building on it. The other one, we just have bought a uh, company. We have not closed on it yet uh, called Port of Subs. Sub sandwich, 75 of them in Nevada, uh, another 60 of them on Western states. The owner is retiring after 50 years. Uh, he announced to his staff this week, as a matter of fact, I'm getting on an airplane in an hour to go to Las Vegas, and tomorrow we meet our 145 or whatever it is, new franchisees that we've already sent videos out to to say, let's have a planning session. Let's tell you what we're going to do. I explain to you what we learned from Remax and a couple other uh, franchises, and we're going to take you to the next level. And so those two are keeping us pretty darn busy right now. Um, you, you've been very involved with like sort of trying to, uh, you, you know, influence housing policy and, and, and things like that. What are, what are your thoughts on sort of the current perhaps housing crisis, the shortage and, and, and how that could be potentially solved down the line? 
Well, the only thing that can solve it is get the interest rate back down. Yeah. And if you, I've got a chart for my convention speech that goes from 72 to uh, 2022. And it has ups and downs. It started at 5%. It went to 16 and a half to 18%, 81 or 82. Steadily went down for, oh, 13 of the last 14 years uh, to three and a half, four percent. Then all of a sudden, it's a 7.6. The average interest rate in the last 50 years is 7.8. And so the interest rate at 7.6 isn't too high. It's the expectations are too high. Hmm. Uh, until the interest rate starts coming down, uh, the real estate industry is going to slog along. I believe that the interest rates will start coming down probably by the last quarter of this year because they're starting to get a hold of inflation and it's not going to drop in a month or two months. Mm -hmm. Inflation is pushed most by food, housing, and oil. And if you look at oil, uh, it's used for fertilizer. It's used for diesel for uh, shipping it or for plowing fields. Uh, it's used to make plastic. Uh, and so uh, those are the three major things that are causing people problem. If they can get that under control, uh, inflation's going to be much higher than it's been. And I think you'll start to see the interest rate edging back down. But I would sincerely doubt in the next three or four years, uh, step on my foot here, uh, <laughs> I doubt if we'll see it go back under 5% for the immediate future. Yeah, we can live with 5%. Dave, well, it's been nothing short of a pleasure to learn about you and just your knowledge and your your story, frankly, and how you went from a kid that was raised, you know, in Marion, Indiana on a farm to going to the military to building a portfolio of properties to starting one of the biggest real estate brokerages in the world and now helping and mentoring and funding, you know, other franchisors and other franchise businesses. And I think that it's an example to uh, anyone listening that you don't necessarily have to have a formal education or parents who have money or an absolutely incredible idea or an invention that's going to change the world. You just have to put in the work, develop a passion around whatever you're doing and, and stay in it. For the long run, I think a lot of times nowadays people just jump around and they yeah. don't necessarily have a focus. And I think that's what the current modern world has kind of told us to do. And it doesn't always work. I think it does for some. Um, but that the focus that you brought to this business has allowed you to uh, not only amass, you know, real estate portfolio and amass financial wealth, but to amass knowledge to then spread to other people. And I think that. Um, I think that that's a that's a, that's why we do this podcast is to share uh, knowledge uh, from people like you to to the rest of our audience. So thank you. Well, thank you. If I can ever help you anyway, let me know. Have a Thanks, Dave. Okay, bye bye. Take, Take care. care.